Hello, and welcome to Revitalize Small Town America by focusing on the future of work. Uh, my name is Ron Kreish. I'm with Golden Shovel Agency, and I believe at this point we have 14 logged in, so we may have a couple more join us. We had 28 signed up, and so we're very excited to bring this to you. I have with me uh, Dean Whitaker uh, from uh, Whitaker Group, and he will be doing a presentation. I got a chance to talk to him a couple weeks ago, and very knowledgeable. I'm very excited to bring this topic to you and really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. A couple of housekeeping items. If you have questions, uh, on the right-hand side of your box, there is a chat area, and below that, a text uh, dialog box to type in. Go ahead and type in your question, and then Dean will either uh, handle that at the appropriate time, or he'll wait to the end, depending on uh, how his presentation is going and how you, your question fits in. We've scheduled about 40 minutes of presentation uh, with question and answers after that. And so with that, Dean, I'm going to turn it over to you. And again, welcome and thanks for doing this and really looking forward to the topic. Thank you Mary, very much, Ron. I, it's a delight to be uh, have this opportunity today and I'm excited about the topic. Um, I'm a little bit um, uh, sleep deprived after last night's election, so I'm, I'm sure some others of us are too. So. I'll, I'll try to take that into account, and I'll try to talk slowly, and, and uh, I'm on my third cup of coffee, so maybe that'll help. Um, welcome, and, and again, thank you for joining us today uh, for this discussion on revi revitalizing small-town America. More specifically today, I'd like to talk with us, with you, about the future of work and how that relates back to revitalizing small-town America. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think of it as kind of seeing around corners. Uh, we've, we've just been given a large batch of uncertainty uh, after yesterday's election. However, the future, in my opinion, is still knowable um, and more so than you might think. And, and stay tuned and I'll show you why. I think it's still, uh, the future is pretty, is relatively predictable. Um, in terms of the, our, my presentation, I'd like to break it into four, three parts. Um, one is to help you become future smart. I want, I want you to become smart about the future and, and how you think about it. I'll talk a little bit about a process that will help you anticipate and, and understand what the trends are that are taking place around us. And then I'll talk a little bit about how those trends shape our future. So those are the things I'd like to discuss with us today. Uh, what I'd like you to come out of our session at, at the end of our conversation is an understanding of the future of work and how that relates back to revitalizing small town economies. I'd like to discuss the role of freelancers. These are what I call gold collar workers and uh, how to attract and grow and support them. And then share a few uh, helpful resources that I think might give you some uh, extra information for those who, of you who want to dig a little deeper. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why you do what you do matters in economic development. This happens to be my hometown. This is where I grew up. Uh, I spent 18 years here. Uh, and this is Earlville, Illinois. It's located about 75 miles west of Chicago. It's a small farm town or, or uh, had its economy. This is a community that had really two basic economic engines. One engine was agriculture, and it was the kind of the community center. In the, in the far distance, you can see the elevator. Uh, so it was a you know, farm to market kind of place. Um, it had, when I grew up there, about 50 businesses. Uh, they had a grocery store and a clothing store and restaurants and banks and bars and hardware stores and implement dealers and car dealers and all those things. But today, in 2016, what remains are four bars and one bank and a laundromat. And so you can begin to see what's happening in small town America. Earlville is, is very typical of, of what's happening in small town. The picture on the right is of the Burlington Northern double track main line that runs from Long Beach, California to Joliet, Illinois. And this is, as you can tell by the shiny rails, it's a heavily used rail line. It passes right through Earlville. That's why Earlville is there. It, it was a, a railroad town originally. It, it was built uh, as, as, a, as a depot on the, on the rail line. Um, the other reason I put in this picture of the rail line and something a lot of people don't, under, don't realize, it's also the route that most fiber optic cables travel. Uh, so the fiber optic cables have been laid in railroad right of way. And that'll, I'll get to that point a little bit later, but kind of keep that in the back of your mind, what I was trying to show, show you there. 
so that's Earlville. This is what it looks like from an aerial photograph. It's, it's in, uh, as I said, 75 miles west of Chicago. It's located in LaSalle County. It's in the center of some of the richest farmland in the world. Uh, the topsoil here runs two to three to four feet thick in places. So black, um, some of the best uh, agricultural land in the world is located in LaSalle County. And so this is uh, something to keep in, in back of the mind in terms of the economic engine. When I was growing up here, a farm, a big farm might have been 300 acres or maybe 500 acres. And then a really, really big farm was 1,500 acres and everyone's jaw dropped when some farmer said he, he was farming 1,500 acres. Now a farm is 20,000 acres and it's done by an agricultural co-op or a corporation that, that, that buys a, you know, buys a piece of farming equipment that costs $500,000, you know, so it's a whole different uh, era in terms of how agricultural is done. Uh, as, as we've seen from the agricultural to the industrial revolution, it's, it's migrated from, you know, employing the bulk of our population to maybe one or two percent of our population now is engaged in agriculture. So quite a, quite a shift over time, just something to keep in mind. Um, this is the site. It looks pretty derelict because it is. It's, it's the demolished, demolished site of a factory. This was Marathon Electric when I was growing up. At age 18, I worked one summer a 12-hour shift running a lathe in this factory. It, it made uh, electric motors that would go inside of furnaces. And this was about 300 people worked here. And it was known as Marathon Electric. Um, in, the, in the 70s, after NAFTA was passed, um, this factory closed. And the, the work that was done in this factory was moved to Juarez, Mexico. So this was one of our two principal economic engines that drove the economy of our little farm town. So we had agriculture and manufacturing. So agri manufacturing closed in the 70s. Agricultural gradually kept um, declining in terms of its employment and economic impact over a 40-year period of time. So th that's not an uncommon story. I think it's pretty typical of, of what goes on in small town America today, particularly in the Midwest. I, I threw this picture of a, of a library in here only on a sentimental reasons. Uh, I grew up um, hanging out at the library. I'm kind of a nerd. Uh, it probably saved my life uh, because it gave me a view of the world, encouraged me to, to leave the small town and go on to study engineering at the University of Illinois and, and eventually um, get into economic development. And, and at one point I was director of industrial development for the state of Illinois. So I've seen economic development from a local perspective, from a from managing two chambers of commerce. I've seen it from the state perspective. I worked at Ball State University and ran the Economic Development Academy. So I've seen economic development from a lot of different angles, but this library was kind of the beginning point of, of my learning and curiosity about the world. I put in another slide. This happens to be my brother. Now, you probably don't get too many people that present pictures of their brother. This was a wedding in Earlville that was taking place outside of the church where I attended. Uh, my brother um, is still in Earlville. He owns a large salvage yard, uh, which has been in the process of what I call scrapping out the community, meaning he has recycled old farm machinery, old buildings, uh, parts of Marathon Electric, all of those, all the scrap metal in the community uh, passed through his hands and went on to become new parts and pieces in steel fabrication went off to the steel mills where they were remelted and made into new products. So he's been doing this for 30 years, um, scrapping out the community. He now draws scrap from about a hundred mile radius around Roeville since it's running out of scrap metal in itself. And he also now owns about 30 houses and a couple farms. So, and, uh, and again, he has a high school degree. He didn't go to college. He stayed there and, basically took over and operated a, a, a scrapyard. So uh, I, he calls it, calls it a recycling center, and it is that. It, it does recycle material from a large area around it, both aluminum and copper and iron and steel, and uh, interesting guy. I want to ask you a little bit about what your first job was. So, um, uh, Victor, can we try to run this poll and see see what uh, kind of response we'll get? Uh, this is a little bit of an experiment for us, so we'll we'll attempt to run this poll, and if it doesn't work, we'll we'll jump back to it. But let's let's go ahead and run the first poll, if we could, Victor. Sure. sure. Well. 
what we're really trying to do here, I want you to think about your first job. What was the very first job for which you were paid money that you had? And if you would kind of check off those that uh, occupations that you might have chosen. So delivering newspaper was mine, uh, mowing lawns with some people, cleaning houses, babysitting, or others. So my very first job um, was delivering newspaper. I was probably 10 or 11 years old and I had a newspaper route. What was your first job? If you would just uh, check the box um, and we'll see how see what your poll is. So if you uh, kind of get out your your mouse and click on those things that um, uh, and then we'll see how the how the poll turns out. We're going to take about a minute for the poll, a little bit less. Um, Victor, do you see yep. some of the of the responses yep. coming in? Yes. Just give me one second. Okay, we're gonna close it now. Wanna share that poll? Sure. And uh, okay, so fifteen percent uh, so is delivered in newspapers, uh, eight percent moving eight percent moving loans, eight percent cleaning houses, forty six percent babysitting, and sixty nine percent says other resources. So here are the results. Oh. Yeah, thank you for, for showing the poll. We can close that, that poll down now. And um, what I was really trying to get at with this, with this question was your first job. What did you learn from that first job? Hold, uh, let, let's try to run one more poll. How old were you when you got that job? This is kind of leading us into a, a little further discussion. Want to run the second poll, Victor? Sure. And how old were you when you, when you had your first job? And 10 to 12, 12 to 14, 14 to 16, and I, less than 30 years old. <laughs> kind of a joke, but not really. Uh, and those of you who have never had a job uh, and, and are living off your trust fund. So th those are some of the options I, <clears throat> I came up with today. But uh, how old were you when you got your first job? Uh, now, there, there have become laws now, I think, child labor laws that kind of preclude people from getting a job too early, but I started out about when I was nine years old working in my dad's excavating business. I picked up rocks in yards that were being landscaped and put them in buckets. I also worked and took copper wire out of the factory incinerator, Marathon's incinerator, and sorted the copper wire out and it got recycled as into other products. My dad kept all that money for some reason, never did understand that part. Okay, so. so 23 of you were 10 to 12 years old, so look at that. Uh, so. Uh, 50, 61 percent of you um, were under 14 when you got your first job, and so the, and and look at the the ages when you got your first job. Thank you, Victor. Can we close that poll down? Sure. And then I'm going to do one more poll. How much did you earn? Let's go back and take a look at that just for a second. And this is our last poll, so I, I won't won't pest you with any more questions for the moment. If you run the one more poll for us, Victor. So a dollar an hour, which was outrageous. I think on my first uh, in on my first job paid 25 cents an hour, but of course that was, um, um, <clears throat> let's say about 60 years ago. That's back when a, a quarter was a quarter. Uh, one to a dollar to 250, 250 to five, and more than five an hour. And I bring this up only because there's quite a few ballot initiatives this last time around on minimum wage. $12 passed, I think, in a number of, of states as a minimum wage now. And I, I wonder how that's going to play out in terms of uh, all the rules and ramifications of that. Uh, so if you would indicate how much you earned on your very first job and uh, give us some sense for, for what that looked like. So 14%. So it looks like ah, more than 36%, more than five bucks an hour. Good for you. I hope you. I hope you put it in your savings account. So get some idea of what what people are earning on their first job. Thank you, Victor, for that. No problem. You're welcome. So um, something I wanted to think about. This is kind of a joke, but not really. How many of you have children living with you, uh, those of you who have children, uh, and have children living with you in their, in their 30s? I'm not going to do a poll on this because I don't want to embarrass anyone or talk too much about it. But I did this at a, at a presentation I, I gave recently. I said, how many of you have children, and how many of you want your children living with you when they're 30? 
there is a trend among uh, younger people today uh, to be very slow to leave home, and that's what this is about. And the second one is, you know, is my old room still ready? And and uh, it would be nice to take a few years off and and rest up. So I think some of us are seeing that with our millennials. But let's talk a little bit about where we're going next. This is Madeline, one of our our two Pappy owned dogs, and she's a very curious one about what's next. And so so am I. Um, Let's talk a little bit about where the economy is going. I think one of the important things to think about with our economy is, in our old economy, people moved and work stayed put. People went to where the work was. In our new economy, in our digital economy, the work moves and people stay put. That's a whole different approach now. So that's something that we need to think about in terms of bringing work to small town America. It used to be we had to go out and, and get a factory to move here, or we had to go out and and gather up the, uh, the resources to be able to uh, put on a presentation. Uh, we had to go out and gather up the resources, attract companies, and, and create new, new, opportunity, new employment opportunities in a particular place. Now the work moves and the people stay put. So we have an opportunity here to look at, at how can we go about attracting work to our community. Um, one of the other things that I'm sure all of you are aware of that's happened is the, the, the skill required for the positions available, even, even operating a, a piece of farm machinery now, is a very sophisticated, complex, high, highly skilled task as we move to GPS systems, automated uh, self-driving tractors. Uh, all those things are happening in rural America. It takes fewer workers, right? Uh, we got huge combines, huge agricultural equipment, uh, and yet we produce more, uh, more commodities than we've ever done before. The last one here I want to talk, dwell on a little more, and we're going to go into this one a little deeper. 30% of us now work uh, out of our home, at least a portion of the time. And that's a very significant number to think about because the trend for that particular uh, item, what we're calling um, flexible work or working out of your home or gold collar work or whatever you want to do term, call it, uh, is accelerating at a very rapid pace. And part of it is technology driven. Technology enables us to be able to offer work opportunities out of our home. I work um, in, in my office, which I happen to have an office. I work here in a, in a building um, about Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. I work out of my home the afternoons when I'm not taking a nap. And also evenings, weekends, uh, it's a whole different game, right? It's, it's a 24-7 world. Uh, we have seven people working in Kathmandu, Nepal, who help us do our research. Uh, we have two full-time people here in Holland, Michigan. Um, Jamie is at home today working because the installers are installing her new bathroom and she needs to be there. So she works at home uh, four days a week. Uh, she comes to the office on actually two mornings a week. One of the things that, that we've seen in this last election and what I want to bring up is the income gap. And one of the reasons we have such a large number of contingent workers and also a number of freelancers is they're supplementing their income. If you look back to 1975, there's, there's been an increasing income gap between per capita income and per capita GDP. The difference in this chart um, in essence, a lot of people, well, many people have not had a raise for a very long time. So if you look at what happened in 75 when NAFTA went into effect, we expanded the, the global workforce by a couple of billion people. So as a result, supply and demand, wage rates have stayed pretty flat since 1975, a long time. But we've continued to increase our per, per capita output. And the difference in the gap between the medium income and the per capita um, GDP, that difference, that, that increased productivity has gone to capital. So one of the reasons that we're seeing a, the 1% the, the continue to get richer is the growth in per capita income has gone to capital, not to labor. And that's because we expanded the labor supply by expanding the global workforce by a couple of billion people. And those are my opinions, by the way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a website called Upwork, and this gets back to the freelance economy. This is um, where that 30% that we've talked about find work to do. One of the things we've talked that I would, would share with you is the, the 
idea of a freelance economy, the average freelancer earns about $40 per hour. Um, we, we gave to a company called LG Chem here in Holland, Michigan, a, a lithium ion battery plant. We gave them $350 million, 151 from the feds, 125 million from the state, to create about 400 jobs here making lithium ion battery plants. Uh, the average annual uh, salary was to have been $54,000 per year. It turns out the current positions that are available at that factory are $13.50 an hour. We paid, now if I, you'll think I'm exaggerating this, but if you check the facts, it's true, we paid $875,000 in incentives per job for 400 jobs back in 2008. Got the number, 875,000 per job. Well, let's take a look at freelancers, all right? So a freelancer makes about $80,000 a year average. So if you had a small community and you had 50 freelancers working in your community, that would be a significant payroll. What kind of incentive would you give to get 50 new jobs in your community that paid $80,000 a year average? I'm guessing quite a bit. Now, there's a number of freelancers already working in your community, I'm guessing. A lot of those are people that have moved away, uh, got tired of the big city and the, and the traffic and congestion and had their first child and thought, hmm, I'm going to come back to my hometown and raise my family here and work from here because with technology today, I can. So that's one of the trends that we see happening. And this, one of the things that freelancers need, back to the care and feeding of, of a freelancer, they need a couple things. One is a fairly predictable income. They need a source for work. This particular website called Upwork is a, is a website um, that was designed to connect freelancers to work. And, I, and I, I recommend that you take a look at it. And this is what freelancers look like. Um, what do freelancers do? Well, they do web development. They, they do mobile development. Uh, they're designers and, and, and creators. They're writers. Uh, there's virtual assistants. There's customer service agents. There's sales and marketing people. There's account, accountants and consultants. So there's a, a lot of different occupations now that are out there using a freelance economy as a way to earn their living, either full-time or part-time, or supplementing their income. Very interesting trend. This is what freelance uh, in America looks like. So there are literally, in 2016, 55 million people, 35% of the U.S. workforce, that now works part of the time as a freelancer. This survey was just conducted last year. Um, and it gives you some idea what the trends are. It's a trillion dollar economy. Uh, more people choose freelancing by choice. 63% choose that rather than because they have to, because they've been laid off at where they used to work. 85% of freelancers say they are likely to, to vote in the 2016 election. We'll see what happens. Um, apparently not enough of them voted for Hillary, although most of them are kind of leaning that way it looks. 70% of freelancers said uh, we need more discussion about how to empower the independent workforce. And one of the things they're looking for is the affordable health care. They, they need a, a, and also savings for retirement. Um, they need also, interestingly enough, a sense of belonging. So while technology has enabled what, what freelancers do, they still want a sense of community. And that's one of the things communities like Earlville can offer, is that sense of belonging. When I grew up in Earlville, there were 1,500 people. When you drove down the street, you nodded or waved to the people that you passed on the, on the street. So it was always a sense of belonging and a, and a, a sense of, of being connected. So you begin to see what, what that freelance economy looks like. And I'll give you a, a reference to that a little bit more in a moment. But you have some sense for what's happening with the freelance economy. Now that said, I want to share with a couple other trends. Um, site location now has become talent driven. I attend recently at the American, the Industrial Asset Council Management Conference, and in that conference, almost all the conversations were about workforce and talent. It was, can I find the people? Where can I find the people? Where can I find the people? That was the re redundant uh, frame of conversations that took place. So location has become talent driven, um, but at the same, that, that's for, for traditional site location consulting. But there's a book out that was called Live First, Work Second, by, written by a friend of mine. And she's really saying like the millennials and the baby boomer, or I'm sorry, the millennials and the Xers. And I'm not so sure about the baby boomers too. 
uh, really about live first, work second. Choose where you want to live, figure out how to earn a living. The, there's a zero-sum talent tool out there. There's something called the talent wars, which are underway. There's an enormous demand for, for specialized skills. Uh, many of those you'll find on Upwork. Um, and, but the business is also going to demand a reinvention of education. Uh, it's, it feels like our educational system is not keeping up with the changes that are going on around us. I mentor an eighth grader. I've been mentoring Andrew since he was in fourth grade. Uh, I was with him yesterday. And I look at what he's learning versus what I think he needs to learn. Um, my intention is to give him as much of the additional things that I think would be helpful for him um, that are not part of his current curriculum. So you begin to see how education needs to change. <clears throat> One of the things I see happening in terms of, I, I was out in Westchester County, New York recently, and that's where Watson was created. It's IBM's headquarters is Westchester County, New York. And you begin to see how Dr. Watson, I presume, uh, is going to change medicine. It's going to become an adjunct AI assistant to the doctor on diagnostics. Um, AI is going to be in our future in some fashion. I suspect we'll learn it'll become a partner with us. It'll be part of, of who we are and how we work. We're going to see robotic caregivers as our population doesn't produce enough people to take care of us, in particular countries like Japan, Italy, Germany, France, and others demographically don't have enough people coming into their workforce to support their economy. Robotic caregivers are probably going to be the answer in Japan, and so hang on to your hat for that one. Funny movie, if you want to take a look at what that could look like, it's called The Robot and Frank, and it's a, a movie about a senior citizen who, who becomes friends with a robot, so I think you'll, you'll find it interesting. Um, robot networks. Now think about this just for a moment. You know, we're, we're all eager to have our cars be self-driving, but our self-driving car is also a sensing device. So now we're going to put on the road remote sensors that gather data. So our, our Tesla car has a 360 camera. It does ultra, it can pick up sound. It also does uh, temperature sensing. And um, so it's basically putting your senses into a mobile device and putting them out on the road and having that information all feed back to a central computer system. Kind of an interesting but a little scary uh, how that works. Uh, Self-driving cars will learn from each other on how to drive through machine learning. So hang on to your hat for that one. I want to talk a little bit about change because obviously after last night's election we're going to be experiencing a fair amount of change. Um, there's really two forms of change I want to talk about. One is change that is about adapting. This is how we currently manage our change that goes on, to, on in our life. Uh, President Obama said last night, well, the sun will still come up in the morning. Uh, yes, it will. And that's a, a, tre a trend that, that we know is pretty probable to happen. Um, but it's part of a linear trend. It's, it's something that reoccurs. Um, it's, we often adapt by looking at our rearview mirror and said, okay, what happened in the past? When this happened before, what did I do? We've been here before. Yep, we have. If you go back in the histories of our, of our presidential elections, we've been here before. Um, but it's a little bit of like a dinosaur approach. We're looking at it in terms of um, are we going to be able to adapt to the changes that are coming at us fast? And one of the changes that's, that one of the things that's driving change we'll talk about in a moment is technology. And the other is demographics. Are we going to be able to adapt to the technology changes that are coming at us fast enough so we don't become obsolete? like the dinosaur. Um, are we going to become a victim of change or are we going to become a champion of it? Now, so that's kind of an adaptive approach to change, but if we take an anticipatory approach, which is what I'm, why I'm talking about future smart and for about a community becoming future smart, it's about an exponential rate of change. One of the things that's happening with technology is not changing at a, at a linear rate. Exponential means the power of the computer has doubled every 18 months for the last 40 years. I suspect it's going to continue to do that. So it, every 18 months, our computers double in our power and drop half in cost. So the exponential rate of change of technology is what's going to be driving this um, frantic pace of change that I see coming our way. Um, we're going to talk a little more about uh, focusing on the trends and anticipating those trends to get in front of it. The old saying about skate where the puck is going, um, figure out where things are headed and be there when it gets there. 
So for small town America, state where the puck is going, not where it's been. Figure out where things are headed and get there before it does. Become future smart. That's really what I'm trying to help you do today. Think about the future in ways that you can become future smart. And the last one I would say is choose a future. Rather than let it happen to you, choose what you want to have happen. So really there's, there's three futures. There's the probable one, which is the direction we've been, we're heading in. It's the possible, which is everything. And then it's the preferred. And, and the issue about, that I'm trying to do here in terms of encouraging you to think about the future, the one degree difference today will make a huge difference where we end up in 2035. So if what we choose to do today will have a huge impact on the future as we go forward in time. The forces driving trends are really four forces. One is a search for resources, whether it be people or, or natural resources or raw materials. Uh, it's driven by technology. It's driven by demographics and governance. So those are the four forces behind trends. Social trends we're seeing right now is the aging of our population. No big surprise there. But that also drives an increasing health concern. And health, part of our health concern is not only can we get it, but can we afford it? And then also, what kind of health care are we going to have? There's an increasing fear of technology. Am I going to be made obsolete by the technology? Am I going to be able to keep up? Will I be able to figure it out? Um, there's also a distrust of, of our institutions. And I'd say this last election is a, a resounding echo of that distrust of our existing institutions and the last one I'd mention is an increasing concern for climate change. Each of these trends presents an opportunity for small town America. What could we do to help the aging population? One small town in Georgia did an interesting thing. They, there's no property tax if you're over 65 years of age in that community. Now they did that as a community referendum, so they said if you're over 65, you don't pay property tax. Now that's a pretty interesting incentive as a way to attract retirees, but interesting approach. Um, what are some of the things we could do about our health care concerns? We could put in broadband fiber services and be able to stay in our homes longer. Um, we could en set up some ways to learn about new technology. Um, lots of things we can do. We can become um, climate uh, concerned and be able to, to make some changes in our own lives. We could also begin looking at what can we do to, to anticipate uh, increasing climate change. I mentioned the exponential rate of, of change, and that's what this chart really shows. Early stages of technology, we kind of ignore it. We think it's going to go away. It doesn't have much of an impact. It's not going to amount to hill of beans. And then five years later, it takes off like a rocket. So that's one of the natures of technology. It's, it's changing at an exponential rate. That means it's doubling every 18 months. Uh, I mentioned Moore's, I mentioned um, some of the technology trends to keep an eye on. Genetics, obviously. A friend of mine right now is in Mayo Clinic. He just had uh, a serious heart episode. He's being treated with stem cells to rebuild the interior of his heart that's been scarred. That's a very experimental treatment. He's, a, he's probably one of the first that they've done this particular procedure on, but because of his genetics, they're able to go in and using stem cells to address a heart condition he has. Very interesting. Robotics, robotics is a broad swath. I, I include self-driving vehicles in robotics. It's, your car is basically becoming a robot. Uh, but what about robotic trucks? Okay, so now we're, we're passing laws that allow trucks to operate um, without a driver. Uh, what does that look like down the road? And what does that do to the, to the the 15 million truck driver jobs. What is that going to look like? Internet of Things, a little scary. Uh, I had a Nest thermostat in my home. My wife made me take it out because it was actually eavesdropping on us. It was gathering data about our occupancy of our home, when what we set our temperature to, uh, whether we were home or not, uh, lots of issues. What she really wanted was a simple thermostat that she could control. So it was more about control than a fear of the technology. But the Internet of Things puts, whoops, sorry, put sensors in our lives everywhere. It puts it into our homes, it puts it into our businesses, it puts it into manufacturing, it puts it into our car, it puts a, a sensor, everything has an IP address, including your, your uh, 
commode. Can you imagine your medical sensors in your commode measuring your uh, effluent to determine your health? It's going to happen. Big data, absolutely. Uh, we're going to see a lot of use of big data, but a little, maybe a little less trust after this last election. The last one I really want to emphasize, and this is where I think small town America can make a huge stride, and that is connectivity. Uh, broadband services in small town America will open up the world just like the railroad did for Earlville. We're going to need broadband services in small communities, and I would make that an absolute priority. Here in Holland, Michigan, where I work, where we just uh, we have a a municipally owned electric utility that just authorized um, the development of our own fiber optic one gigabyte and and geared towards 40 gigabyte uh, network for our downtown area. It'll be expanded to the entire community within three years. So we're gonna we're gonna have a one gig fiber throughout our downtown beginning construction in March, probably be a year from now. We'll, we'll have one gig fiber throughout our downtown and within three years we'll have it throughout our community. It's about being connected to the world. One of the other problems with connected to the world, um, cyber war is becoming an increasing concern because we've militarized cyberspace. We've been at a, a, a cyber war now for a long time. My tiny little company uh, was hacked and, well, hacked. So it was socially engineered to my colleague who sent a message from supposedly me asking her to transfer funds. So cybersecurity is going to become an increasing concern, but it's also going to become how we're going to, I mean, there's tremendous opportunities. What about setting up a cybersecurity system within your community and for your community? And, and building a whole company around cybersecurity. Uh, focus your educational system on, on teaching people how to, how to protect ourselves. One thing is climate change. I mentioned that one trend. Extreme weather is going to increase. We're going to convert natural gas to replace coal. What opportunities do these create for small town America? Water becomes a global issue, you bet. We're sitting here in Holland, Michigan on one of the largest bodies of fresh water in the world. Politically, you, um, the book that I was going to rec that I recommend to you is called *The Accidental Superpower*. It really talks about what would have been—I'll say would have been—not knowing what the new president's going to do, but how we can become a superpower because of our proximity to Mexico. Our demographics—we're only producing 1.2 people per per couple in terms of our birth rate. We are not replacing ourselves. Neither is Japan, China. Neither is Japan, China. Uh, Italy, France, UK, or Germany. Each one of us has a baby booming population moving off the stage, either retiring or dying, and not having enough people to replace, uh, replace us. And as a result, there's not enough people in the earning bracket to support that economy. So we're going to see some very interesting things happen economically. Um, the hope was, I'll say was or maybe still is, that immigration from Mexico and the United States would offset our declining population. So something to think about. City-state mega regions grow. Yes, we're going to see more and more kind of a city-state and less reliance on federal government, I think. Government becomes more transparent. Well, maybe. I'm not so sure now. But the idea was we're going to demand it. Um, I gave a presentation out in Westchester County, New York recently, in which I spoke to the Business Association, Westchester County, New York, is the first county north of Manhattan. It just happens to be where Donald Trump and, and, uh, and Hillary Clinton both live in Westchester County, New York. Um, they live 20 miles apart. Most people don't know that. They also don't know that their daughters are good friends. So there's a lot of strange things going on out there. But one of the things I told them, I said, if we don't get this income inequality figured out, the folks with the pitchforks are coming for them. So what we're looking at is a political revolt is underway. We've just seen this in our election yesterday. Uh, people are saying, hey, this, doesn't, this, this system doesn't work for me. I'm not part of the 1%, and it needs to change or else I'm out of here. So those are some of the things. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the immigration uh, website in Canada failed due to the high volume of people hitting on the website to figure out how to immigrate to Canada. So uh, stay tuned. We're just at the beginning of our political revolt. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, these slides will be made available to you either through SlideShare, through SlideShare, and also um, through Golden Shovel. 
<clears throat> and here are three sources. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Freelance Economy Survey, I'd encourage you to go check that out. Um, there's an excellent um, document that I came across called Framework for Creating Small Town uh, Growth Strategies, put out by the US EPA. I think you'll find that interesting. And there's another one called the Purdue Agile Strategy. We're going to talk about two of those for a moment. Um, the, the framework for creating a smart growth economy it really talks about how many small communities in the United States are struggling because their economies were built largely on, on a single economic uh, factor. They were either an extractive economy, they were agriculture or mining or manufacturing. And those economies have shifted and changed and now we have to reinvent our economic reason to exist. And that, this is really about developing a strategy for that. And it's well-documented. It's about smart growth. It gives, gives examples. It shows sources of grant funding. Uh, so if you do a search on framework for creating a small growth uh, economic development strategy, you'll find this document put out by the US EPA. <clears throat> but I'll, I'll add to that, it takes a very traditional approach uh, to how, uh, to developing a strategy. It's about asset mapping and kind of a hierarchical you know, goals, mission, vision, statement, uh, strategy, activities, and, and tactics. So it's, it's a very traditional approach. Now I want to share with you one other one, which I think is, is uh, worth a look. This is called strategic doing. It's a different process. I was just down in Covington, Kentucky, in a, a working with a three-county economic development group, doing something called strategic doing. What strategic doing is, is about, it's about using your network, each of our networks, and you come together and you, and you, you do an asset map of, the, of what each asset, the, each of the people on that, involved in that particular framing question are willing to contribute to address the concern. The group I was in was about economic development marketing. There was another group that was looking at infrastructure. Another group was looking at transportation. So each of those groups had a framing question and each of the group of those seven or eight people in that, in that particular group or that team were asked four questions. Um, and the first one was, what assets do you have that you're willing to contribute? So you put those on the table. And then you come back around and you say, what, based on these assets that we all have available to each of us, what should we do together? What will we do together? Um, what, I'm sorry, what could we do together? What should we do together? What will we do together? And basically, when do we meet again? So there's a re, it's a recursive process. It's called agile strategy. So it, it, it comes back around again, and you revisit your strategy every 30 to 90 days and re, revamp it based on what you've done. The benefit to this approach is everyone does a little bit. No one has to do it all. Um, strategic doing, the whole process of, of developing a strategic doing approach can be done in a half a day. The strategic planning model usually takes three or four days and multiple meetings, usually ends up with a plan that sits on a shelf. This is a very action-oriented approach. And if you go to strategic doing, this is a program coming out of Purdue University. It's called the Agile Strategy Lab. And the link is, is I passed it on. For those of, of you readers out there, which we still have a few, <clears throat> a couple book recommendations, Future Smart, uh, Trends That Will Transform the World, excellent book about what industry sectors are changing and how. Another one is called Bold and looks at uh, how to go, the bold moves that are being, being taken right now, but people like Elon Musk and his SpaceX and some of the moves that are happening. Uh, the other book on second machine age, um, it's really talking about robotics and how this next machine age will play out. Um, a scary book. Um, I, I give one scary one and one antidote. Um, the rise of the robots is talking about how the, the uh, robots will threaten our jobs of the future. You bet. I think that's, that's spot on. And the other one is abundance, and it's talking about the future is better than you think. And so if you, if you read one, you need to read the other as the antidote. Um, that's all, I, all that I have to share at the moment. I'll be glad to respond to questions, and um, if any of you have uh, a desire to, please reach out to me by phone and or email. I respond to both. Um, you can text me as well. Uh, I didn't put my, my uh, cell phone number there, but you can drop me a note. Um, but again, the work you do is very important, and I'm very interested in, in helping and support you in what you're doing. So please let me know how I can best do that. Back to you, Ron.
Well, thank you, Dean. Uh, I have a, a question that I did receive, and also uh, just I want to send out to the group that we will be sending this information out in a follow-up email so that uh, you won't miss it. But the question that I had was, do you have any specific uh, example of a community that has attracted these type of groups, whether it's uh, people that have come back that were uh, originally from that community or actually attracted a mobile workforce or a creative class in? Yeah, actually I have a very specific one and it happens to be where I live and um, <clears throat> it happens to be a friend of mine. His name is Jason Sosa. Jason moved out um, of here. Uh, he was a, a social entrepreneur. He developed a technology uh, of facial recognition that would recognize emotion, developed the software, uh, tried to raise funds here in West Michigan, found our conservative nature in West Michigan not to be con conducive to venture capital funding of his idea. He ended up moving out to Boulder, Colorado. And Boulder's done some fascinating stuff, uh, well worth a look. What Boulder did was they sent Jason an airplane ticket. Uh, they said, come out and, and, and visit our community, find out what we're about, uh, meet with our community leaders. Uh, some of their technolo technology leaders in Boulder uh, had basically office hours for, for the people that they'd recruited from around the company to come and visit. Uh, uh, Jason came back from his visit to Boulder, <clears throat> told his wife uh, and, and, uh, that they, they needed to sell everything and pack up and move to Boulder, which they did. They took their, their two children, packed up, sold stuff, moved to Boulder. Jason got in, in with the leadership in Boulder. He went through something called Techstars. Techstars sent him to New York City where he moved for a period of time to go through what they call their boot camp. He went through their boot camp, uh, which was designed to sharpen up his skills and go out and raise money that he needed to fund his adventure. Um, uh, he had already raised a small amount of money in West Michigan, about 700,000. He raised a total of $3 million in his efforts, moved out to uh, New York, as I said, um, through a series of very interesting things. Techstars turned out to be a more of a reality show uh, there was a VC fund that tried to do an end run on his program and uh, steal his idea and some of his top people. Uh, they negotiated that back out, and he moved back out here again after after his uh, battle in New York. And uh, then eventually um, put his family in an RV and traveled out to California, lived there for a couple of years, became an advisor to venture capital funds, and now advises startup companies on how to raise money. So kind of an interesting tale. But I bring it up because he's what I would call um, a, a digital nomad. <clears throat> they literally homeschooled their children, put them in an RV, and traveled the country. Once they had their third child, they decided to settle down back to Holland, Michigan. And what brought them back here, and, and why I think it's important uh, for the audience to keep in mind, they came here because this is where his, his father is, this is where his sister is, it's about family. So as you look around, find out what what are, which of these freelancers have moved away from your community and are now at a life stage where they're having their first children? Uh, I'm working with, a, with an employment recruiter uh, for Silicon Valley. She happens to be in Lowell, Michigan. Uh, she's telling the story about uh, how people move out to California. They find out that the house out there is uh, a small two-bedroom, one, one or two bath is a million and a half dollars. Um, they find out that the schools they want to get their children in has a lottery uh, system uh, or has a long waiting list, and they determine that once they're at that stage in their life, maybe that, that small town was not such a bad place. They look at their hour and a half commute each way to work every day, decide, you know, maybe there's a better way to do this. So it's mostly at a different stages in their life when they, they, they decide that maybe there's a better way to do this, and maybe small town America has something to offer. And, and I, I think about um, recruiting at your 10-year class reunion, your high school class reunion, as a place to look, because that's usually what people are at a life stage where they've gotten married and had a couple of children. Maybe that hometown doesn't look so bad. And if they're in an occupation, and not many of us are, are most of us now have an occupation that's somewhat mobile um, and maybe totally mobile. Uh, my business can be anywhere on the planet. Uh, and we're kind of proving that now with our office in Kathmandu. So I think one of the things you think about as a community is what is it you could offer 
to, to attract these people up. Quality of life is kind of an overused term. Connections, a sense of community, a connections with your family, reconnecting with your family. What, what freelancers want, as I said earlier, is they're looking for a way um, to, uh, you could offer an incentive. But here's the interesting thing for me, uh, Ron. We paid $875,000 per job for our manufacturing jobs to make lithium ion batteries here. If we took a small fraction of that and say offered a relocation incentive of say 3,000 uh, bucks to pay some of these moving expense to come back here and, and operate from Holland, Michigan with their virtual freelance business that makes $80,000 a year, I think that would be a good deal. And so I'm not, I'm not advocating that we give away money necessarily, but I'm just suggesting that <clears throat> when we look at the incentives that we're offering <coughs> to attract manufacturing jobs, freelancers might be a really interesting bargain on one hand and also be a way to reconnect people back to the community. That's your question, Ron? Yeah, that was a great example. Thank you. So take a look at Boulder is the other one. Portland, Oregon has done some really interesting things, not necessarily a small town. Um, in that study that I mentioned uh, for the EPA, um, oops, let me get back to it a second. Um, the smart growth strategy has a number of case studies. A small community in, in the state of Washington is one of their case studies. They have three or four very interesting case studies in that report. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I believe we're coming up on the end. Um, I don't have any other further questions. It looks like you've covered the topic very thoroughly. Um, so you. any closing remarks? Uh, and then after that, like I said, I'll, I'll work to get the email out to all the attendees afterwards. Okay, well, thank you for that, Ron. Uh, just a closing remark, and uh, as I said earlier, I think the important thing um, for all of us to remember, it's all about people. Uh, that we're in the people business, not necessarily in the thing business. Uh, people vote their emotions. Uh, people uh, respond emotionally, not necessarily logically sometimes. Um, but the idea behind uh, where I think we're, we're headed as a community is it's still about people and how do we um, keep that in the back of our mind as we go through our work and economic development. It's still about people. It's people like my brother. Uh, it's people like uh, Jason Sosa. Um, it's still all about people, and I think that's important. And the last thing I would say is the economic development work that people do is so important. Uh, the community that I, uh, that I grew up in did not have the leadership that it needed in order to re revisit its economy and reinvent itself. When you look at the leadership uh, demonstrated by communities like where I live now in Holland, Michigan, or you look at the examples in, in the smart, smart growth uh, strategy document EPA put together, it's really about community leadership. It's about having the leaders to envision the future and be able to move the community in that direction. Thank you very much, Ron, for the chance to be here. And again, if I can be of service to the, to the members of the audience, drop me a note, feel free to call. Uh, let me know how I can support you in, in what you're doing. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for everyone that attended. And until next time, um, we'll see you. Thank you. Thanks, Ron.